and welcome to the chapter 12 lecture video. Now the reason I am so excited to be recording a lecture video at 11 o'clock at night on a Wednesday is because this chapter is on one of my all-time favorite topics. It's on species interactions and as somebody who studies a pollinator obviously I love species interactions but a fun fact about me that you may not know is that I also love parasites. I love all different kinds. I love learning about them. I think maybe because I'm like really into horror movies. That's why I'm really into parasites is because they're like real life horror movies. I just think their life cycles are so fascinating. So we're going to talk about some of them. I love parasites so much that you may have noticed that I have a bunch of stickers of cute drawings of them on my laptop. I will put them there in this lecture slide. And I also have a collection of pins that I bought on Etsy that are parasites. I will show them to you now. So this one here is a schistosoma parasite. This is a blood fluke. Uh, it's a human parasite. Gross. <laughs> and this chunky boy right here is the male and he has a weird special groove that the female lives inside of. So this is a male and female blood fluke schistosoma mating pair, which actually, if you were my invertebrate zoology class, which I think is only Kelsey. Kelsey learned about these last semester. Wait, no, Graham was in it too, but Graham wasn't in the lab. So Kelsey learned about it, Graham learned about it. If there's anybody else that was in invertebrate, I apologize if I'm forgetting right now off the top of my head. Here's another pin of one of my favorite parasites. This is an isopod, a deep sea isopod that has eaten the tongue of a fish and has replaced its tongue and now it eats all the food that comes into its mouth. There's a really bad horror movie that's based on this that I like. I think it's called The Bay. Um, this is another cool parasite. This is a pin of a barnacle that that lives inside the testicles of a crab and then spreads throughout its nervous system and takes over its brain and then feminizes the crab and makes it raise its barnacle parasite young like they're there it's own. And then this is another one. This, it kind of looks like a mushroom cloud more than anything, but this is like a drawing of a cordyceps fungus busting out of the head of an ant. Now, Kelly knows about these because I talked about them in Gen Bio and she took my Gen Bio lab section or lecture section. So Kelly heard about cordyceps fungus, parasite. And then the last one that I put a link to a video about on Schoology for you to watch because they're so cool. This is a snail and it's got a nematode living in its eyeballs that turn them into like pulsing disco lights so that birds eat them. Aren't they the coolest? I love them. So let's talk about the stuff that's actually going to be on the exam. Okay. Pew, 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 parasites. Okay, let's talk about my favorite things, species interactions, population dynamics, and natural selection, baby. Okay, there's some bees on the floor. Most of these are the same species, but there's a different species down there, which is why it's species interactions. So first, let's review the different types of species interactions that you can have. This should all be reviewed from Gen Bio 2, so hopefully easy peasy lemon squeezy. First, let's talk about mutualism. This is a species interaction in which both uh, species A and species B in the interaction benefit. So here in this picture, I've got some leafcutter ants that are farming fungus with the leaves that they're using to grow their crop. So the fungus and the ant are benefiting. The ant gets nutrition from the fungus um, and breaks down the leaf, the nutrition and releases nutrition from the leaves, 
for the ants and the fungus is grown by the ants. So that's how the fungus benefits. Pollination interactions are beneficial for the most part, well, not all the time. This one's beneficial because the bees are getting nectar, probably just nectar from this flower. Looks like an allium. Um, the flower is receiving pollination and being able to reproduce because the bees are visiting it. So two examples of mutualisms. Both are benefiting. Commensalism is a relationship um, where one species... A receives no benefit from the relationship, and then species B has a positive benefit. So clownfish and sea anemones are the typical example you hear about with um, positive or commensalism interaction. So the clownfish gets protection from the sting stinging by from the stinging nematocysts of the anemone, but the anemone doesn't really get much out of the relationship. Bromeliads growing on trees are a really great example of uh, a good example of commensalism. For the most part, they they just live on the tree. They don't derive any nutrients or anything from it. They don't parasitize it. So um, the tree doesn't really get anything. But of course, the bromeliad gets a nice high growing in, in optimal growing condition up high on the tree. Now, competition is when both species A and species B are negatively impacted by this interaction. So this is a hyena and a cheetah, oh he may add, or she. And they are competitors for a shared food resource and when they're both fighting over that resource, they negatively impact each other. Amensalism is um, when one species, species A, is not affected by the relationship but the other species is negatively impacted. Um, so this would be like an animal or a human stomping on plants in the wild. The person is not impacted, but the plant is negatively impacted. Or maybe a tree that's growing a little taller um, than some other trees and it shades out sunlight availability. Uh, it doesn't really do anything to this tree. If it was already growing there, um, especially if it's not competing for nutrients in the soil with these, um, but it negatively affects uh, this plant. You can have predation where one species benefits and the other species is negatively impacted. This is a cuttlefish feeding on a crab. Obviously that crab is not benefiting from this relationship. Um, and then there's parasitism, one of my favorites. This is another example where one species is benefiting, one species is negatively impacted by the relationship. There's that sticker on my laptop of that snail with the nematodes living in its eye stalks. It's not very biologically accurate because it's got its eyeballs down here when these are actually its eyeballs, but it's still very cute. This is a tapeworm. This is a Ant with cordyceps, these are all stickers I have on my laptop. Ticks and lice are some other human examples. That's parasitism. Um, usually in predation, like the difference between predation and parasitism is that the predator is eating a whole, the whole part of the plant, of the organism. Herbivory in the context of this relationship could be termed predation because it's an organism is eating whole parts or part or an entire animal. In parasitism, usually the parasite's life cycle is closely mimicked or matched um, or follows the life of their host. And they um, sometimes they kill their host, sometimes they don't. Now, parasitoidism is a, is a very specific term for generally used to describe insects when they lay their eggs in their host and then the larvae of that organism live as parasites inside their host. These are actually two examples of parasitoidism that I just found in my garden in my backyard. So I think I shared this video with you on Schoology of the aphid mummies. All these little white ones, these are puffed up exoskeletons 
of aphids that a wasp laid its egg inside of it and the larva ate the aphid from the inside out. And if you look really closely, there's a hole in all these where a wasp popped out of it. All the black ones are non-parasitized aphids. And then this is a tomato hornworm I found in my garden that just covered in cocoons of a wasp that laid its eggs inside here. So a wasp used its ovipositor to inject eggs in the caterpillar and then they slowly eat it from the inside out while the caterpillar is still alive. And um, I think I've told you this before, but my partner's a parasitoid biologist. He studies the family of wasps that live in these cocoons. So of course we brought it inside and reared it inside of a solo cup and all these little black spots you see are wasps that popped out of the cocoons on the caterpillar. So cool. Oh, and this is another sticker on my laptop that is a cartoon drawing of that. There, I found this really cool infographic um, on this Parasite Ecology blog that I'm going to start reading now. It seems really cool. Um, that kind of explains the difference between... Um, a parasite, a predator, uh, and a parasitoid. So it is all in like relation to the victim slash host fitness, whether or not the host dies and how many victims there usually are. So like, um, typically with a predator or a micro predator, there's more than one host or prey item. With parasites or parasitoids, there's usually only one victim. Um, yeah, this is a really great infographic for being able to understand the difference between predation, parasitism, and parasitoidism. Now what we are going to do in person, in class, is we're going to talk about how what you might expect the population dynamics to be like in each of these species interaction scenarios. So think about the processes of immigration, emigration. Mostly I want you to think about birth and death rates of a population. And then think a little bit about how interactions in each of these different types of scenario might affect the population dynamics of both of the species A and species B in each of these types of interactions. And we will talk about that in person. Now, species interactions are really, really strong. And because they affect the life or death and the survival of organisms, they can be really, really strong agents of natural selection. So something else we're going to talk about in class is how the species interactions that are pictured in both of these, this predation example and this mutualism example, um, how might each of these species be influencing the evolution of the other? How are lions influencing the evolution of zebras or have influenced? How are zebras influencing the evolution of lions? How might this, I think this is a trout lily, how might this trout lily be affecting the, and I, I think this is a trout lily and this is a spicebush swallowtail. I might be getting that wrong. We'll see <laughs> when I close out of this. Um, how might this spicebush swallowtail be affecting the evolution of the trout lily and the trout lily affected the evolution of its pollinator. We'll talk about that in class and I want you to come up with some um, hypotheses you could possibly test. So let's talk about, you can't talk about agents of natural selection and species interaction without talking about Darwin's finches. Hopefully this is more review from GenBio2, but it's just such a really great example of how species interactions can influence natural selection that I just want to go over it in detail and it's outlined in your textbook. So in this scenario, this is the original distribution of seed sizes. So we're talking about species A would be the seeds, species B would be the original bird ancestor. So this is the original distribution of seed sizes in the plant population. This is the original normal distribution of beak sizes. So you have some that are small, some that are large, but most of, most of them are medium, same with the seeds. Um, this is looking at the distribution of seed sizes that are actually selected by the birds. Um, so because the smaller seeds are easier to crack, the, there's uh, some preference for the smaller seed size. 
if you can crack that seed, it's not reproducing. If you're eating it, it lowers the reproductive success of the smaller seeds. You lower the reproductive success of the smaller seeds. You cause directional selection in the seed size population. So the seeds in response are going to evolve larger sizes and may be harder to crack. And then in response to that, in an our evolutionary arms race, the that's because the seed is the primary nutrition source for the bird. That's going to cause directional selection in bill size so that the bill size gets bigger so that it can crack the tougher seeds. Um, but then you might imagine a scenario where you might have disruptive selection, which we talked about before, um, where that might result in two diversions in seed size and bill size. So just wanted to go through that example a little bit. Oh, and then in this example, we were talking about um, disruptive selection. It's competition between the individual birds that causes them to separate out into um, different niches to feed on different seed sizes. We'll talk about niches in a second. Um, I also uploaded a YouTube video I would like you to watch on my all-time favorite story um, in evolutionary biology um, of coevolution and how Darwin basically predicted that this moth would exist hundreds, no, not hundreds, but maybe f several decades before anyone even found it because he predicted this moth existed based on the morphology of this flower in Madagascar. And it's just like, you have to watch the video. It's one of my all-time favorite stories. Um, but species interactions can vary across geographic space. So it's not like, for example, the species interaction between this garter snake and this newt are going to be exactly the same in every single environment. What we just talked about a little bit with this example here is an example of kind of like an evolutionary arms race where there's a really close co-evolution between two species. And then you see each species responding in kind to the evolution of the other. Um, in like a cycle and you can see this is a really cool example of there being geographic variation in the uh, strength of selection depending on the field site so this is an example of garter snakes that feed on newts and these newts have evolved in response a tetrodotoxin which depending on the species of snake can be very poisonous to the predator but in response to that Garter snakes have evolved resistance to the tetrodotoxin, and there are some populations, um, so if you look at this map here, and then this red line here is a population of garter snakes that has evolved very strong <laughs> resistance to this tetrodotoxin. They're basically invincible to it, um, which means that probably the newts that they are encountering in that environment are very, very toxic and exerting a very strong selection pressure. Um, you see, but there are, there's geographic variation within this single spot population and species of garter snakes in their resistance to the, tro the toxin. So you have less resistant garter snakes that live in these different areas along uh, the western coast of the U.S., um, and so maybe in these areas where you see low resistance to tetrodotoxin in the garter snakes, maybe there's some other prey item. And so it's not entirely um, necessary for them to be able to resist this toxin because they have something else that they can feed on. But maybe in these areas where they have really high tetrodotoxin resistance, they either eat this, this newt that's toxic or they get nothing. And so there might be a much st stronger selection pressure um, in these areas that are in orange. Really cool study here. Here's another great example of um, how species interactions can differ across geographic space. Um, 
mycorrhizal fungi, which you hopefully learned about in GenBio, um, are fungus that have a mutualistic relationship with plants. They grow near their roots on them, and they make they break down nutrition in the soil and make it more readily available to the plant roots. So the mycorrhizal mycorrhizal fungi um, get a place to live, and the plant in return gets the release of nutrients from the soil, nutrients made more readily available by the mycorrhizal fungi. Now, mycorrhiza fungi can be beneficial in low nutrient environments, but if the nutrient content is really high and they don't really need help obtaining nutrition from the soil, they can actually be energetically costly to the plant and become not beneficial. <laughs> not not really a parasite, well, kind of a parasite, sort of, because one species is getting a benefit and one is not, but only in high nutrient soils. So this is a really good ex example graph here looking at that. So like here's a plant without mycorrhiza. Low nutrition in the soil, it's not available to them. The mycorrhizal fungi make it more available. They're going to die. But if there's high nutrition, they can actually obtain more nutrients from the environment than they can with mycorrhizal fungi. So mycorrhizal fungi, really optimal in a poor nutrition soil, can actually become slightly parasitic in high nutrition environments. Um, here's another graph that just shows that at low soil nutrient concentrations, the plants that have the mycorrhiza, um, they get a net benefit, but if there's already really high nutrients, they actually take away nutrition from the plant and are energetically costly. So that's a really good example in addition to that snake and those newts. But in reality, Unlike all the examples we just talked about, species interactions usually are not one-to-one -one interactions. There's a lot of other stuff going on in the environment. And one way of looking at that is with these interaction networks um, that we're going to talk a little bit about later. This is one that's um, just looking at all of the interactions of a bunch of groups of organisms in an environment. Each of these lines in this graph represents a single interaction and you can see that the seed feeding bird in I'm guessing this community that's represented by this this um, interaction web, this bird has a lot of interactions and is very influential in the community based on its numerous species interactions with other organisms in the environment. Um, this can be true for pollinator. Their pollinator interactions are usually called pollinator networks because while some pollinators only feed on a single one species feeds on a single species of plant, that's some do that. Like this Rufus hummingbird is only feeding on this hummingbird flower in this idealized pollination network. Um, but European honeybees as I've probably been on a rant on before, they're very generalist. They'll feed on a lot of different types of plants. Um, monarch butterflies, they've only got California milkweed and uh, geranium in here, but they'll feed on a lot of different types of, not as caterpillars, but as adults. They'll collect nectar from a lot of different things. Um, and there's a bumblebee in here. This is Bombus huntii, so this must be, huh, orange belted bumblebee. Wait, actually, I'm really bad at bumblebee common names. That's probably Bombus huntii. It could be Bombus ternarius. I can't remember off the top of my head because I know bumblebee species names better than common names. Um, anyway, this bumblebee feeds on lots of different plant species. Um, so they're diffuse. It's not really a one-to-one -one kind of thing. And some species interactions maybe have more or less effect on other on the species in the air interaction than others. So now that we've talked about multiple species interacting with each other, let's talk about the a fundamental niche versus a realized niche. So hopefully you also remember the concept of a niche from GenBio2. Um, the n ecological niche, which is basically synonymous with the fundamental niche, the ecological niche is the range of physical and chemical conditions under which a species can persist. 
And by persist, we mean survive and reproduce, because it doesn't really mean much if you don't reproduce in the next generation. And the array of essential resources that a species utilizes in the environment. Now, the definition for a fundamental niche is basically uh, similar. It's the total range of environmental conditions under which a species can survive and reproduce. But in reality, a species is generally not receiving all of the optimal environmental conditions under which it has optimal survival and reproduction. And so in reality, what they live in is a realized niche, which is the portion of the fundamental niche that a species is actually exploiting as a result of the interactions with other species. So um, perhaps in this model of a realized niche of birds living in one species of evergreen tree, perhaps if all these other birds didn't live there, this Blackburnian warbler might be able to inhabit the entire area of the tree um, but perhaps because of competition, its realized niche for each of these species is smaller than what its fundamental niche might be within um, the canopy of this tree. Species interactions have also led to really awesome adaptive radiations in lots of different groups of organisms. You also talk about this in GenBio 2, so hopefully most of this lecture is review for you. Um, adaptive radiation is evolution from a common ancestor of divergent forms adapted to distinct ways of life. So you also talk about the Lake Victoria cichlid fishes. There are other lakes in Africa in which cichlid fish, cichlid fish have experienced adaptive radiations. There's approximately 2,000 species known of cichlid fishes. Hundreds of them coexist in individual African lakes. Here, um, the largest radiations, which are in Lake Victoria, Malawi, and Tanganyika, they have generated um, between 250 to 500 species per lake of cichlid, which is insane. Um, yeah, and then it took for um, Victoria, it took no more than 15 to 100,000 years for all these species to evolve, less than 5 million years for Malawi, and then for about 10 to 12 million years for Lake Tanganyika. Um, the radiations in Lake Victoria and Malawi, um, because of that, they display the highest sustained rates of speciation known to date in vertebrates, Lake Victoria and Lake Malawi, because we know how old, through geological dating, we know how old these lakes are. They're not very old, and because given the number of cichlid species they have, it is like the fastest rates of speciation that are known to date in vertebrates. Um, the evolution of all these different lineages in these different lakes has been shaped over time over some parts long times 12 million years for lake tanganyika only about 15,000 for lake victoria they've mostly been shaped by like population expansion fragmentation um contraction of each of these lineages um as they colonize other lakes and diversified but then when they collapsed and the lakes dried up um, over time, and then they recolonize lakes. So th this episodic drying of lakes, filling up again, drying of lakes and filling up again. So there's all these extinction and recolonization events have led to a, a whole amazing diversity of niches that are um, being filled with these different cichlids. Sexual selection also seems to be a strong play in these cichlid fishes too, which is one of the reasons they think they're diversifying so fast. Another really good example is honey creepers in Hawaii. Um, these are just different species of honey creeper birds that live there. Um, and the different ecological niches and uh, organisms that they feed on and use in the environment. Each of these different beaks has evolved for a different specific purpose and a different ecological niche. 
Um, these parrot bills actually use tools to feed, and that's related to their beak shape. Um, so you see a, a, an adaptive radiation and beak shape in Hawaiian honey creepers too. Really good example. So that's it for one of my favorite topics. Um, tune in for chapter 13 coming either tomorrow or the day after, and then we'll be all caught up. Woohoo! Okay, bye bye.